You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch the program live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The courthouse was busy again today. Not a lot else going on in town, but a buzz around the courthouse for some arguing and an important announcement on the trial date for the January 6th case. This is the one brought by the special counsel, Jack Smith. The two first lines in the story on the terminal are everything. Zoe Tillman writes, Donald Trump's trial in Washington is set for March 4th. Yes, I said March 4th on federal charges that he conspired to obstruct the 20 election. That means the trial is set to start the day before Super Tuesday. 14 states, including Texas and California, hold their primaries that day. What could go wrong? The date announced uh, by Judge Chutkin, after hearing arguments, this basically was like a mini trial that they held uh, in there. But of course, there are no cameras in a federal courtroom, so I cannot bring you in there. What I can do is bring you Sarah Forden from World Headquarters in New York. Bloomberg's legal editor is with us. Hey, Sarah, we miss you in the Capitol. I'll say right off the bat, but... Hey, this Joe. trial date, March 4, is not what Donald Trump was looking for. I mean, the next is move is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. So what options does he have at this point to delay? Well, there could be delays, and maybe that's one reason why um, the judge set the date as early as she did. This is uh, March 4th, as you said, before Super Tuesday. It's also before the March 25th uh, New York um, Manhattan case and the hush money um, trial. So there could be some, some wiggle room here for her to, to you know, incorporate uh, delays and requests for delays, uh, but still bring it out you know, before Trump um, wanted, which was you know, he wanted to delay it until April of 2026. <laughs> Yes, that would be a little bit extreme in the other direction here. So is the smart analysis somewhere in the middle? Could be somewhere in the middle. And um, there was very interesting uh, back and forth between the prosecutor and the defense attorneys about how much time was needed. And um, the prosecutor for the DOJ, Molly Gaston, laid out uh, the facts that they have they have turned over 12.8 million pages of evidence in this case, but they've also delivered a, a sort of digital roadmap to the indictment where they have paired key pieces of evidence in the case with key paragraphs in the indictment. Mm -hmm. So it should be easy for the defense to parse, you know, how the the case is being built against Trump. Yeah. So what did we learn today uh, from this this set of arguments? It was almost a peek into what this trial might look like, the contours it might take on. Well, I mean, obviously, this is going to be the federal case about efforts by Trump and his allies to overturn the 2020 election. A lot of the facts sets are similar to the case that Fannie Willis has filed in uh, in Georgia, in Fulton County. Um, But we have key differences in in those two cases, Uh, one being a state case. Uh, cannot be pardoned if there is a conviction in that case, whereas a federal uh, conviction could be pardoned if, if Trump you know, were to either win or one of his you know, allies were to win in the presidency. John Loro, uh, Donald Trump's attorney, uh, called the idea that they get this going four months from now uh, an outrage to justice. And I guess he was quite animated in the courtroom. Our reporting says he was raising his voice at times. Judge Chuckin at one point had to ask him to take the temperature down. Does that tell us anything about the way Trump's legal team will comport itself in court? Well, it's interesting because we saw this sort of similar dynamic play out in the setting of the Florida trial date, um, which is going to be in May. That's in the classified Mm -hmm. documents case. The the judges here are really trying to walk a fine line between the legal requirements of making sure they handle all the evidence and, you know, they're they're running a fair um, and proper trial with with the kind of the heat being turned up on the political calendar. There was another important uh, court date today, uh, the one in Georgia, having to do with Mark Meadows' attempt to have that moved uh, to federal court. Even if that decision's been made, will we not hear an announcement on that for some time, Sarah? So, what's going on in Yeah, Georgia? we have a reporter in the courtroom. We are waiting um, for the first news out of that hearing. We are expecting that Mark Meadows will be testifying about why he, he thinks his case should be moved to federal mm-hmm. court rather than state court. Um, and his argument is that he was acting in his duties as a federal employee, and so that would justify a federal trial. Um, the counter to that, you know, Fannie Willis has already filed her position, which is that there's nothing in the law 
that allows a federal employee to try to subvert, uh, you know, fairly run election. And um, also, she's argued that the Hatch Act applies, which prevents uh, federal employees from political activity while they're in office. Sarah, great to have you back. Sarah Forden, who's got more plates in the air than most editors right now. Bloomberg legal editor. How'd you like that title right now in Washington (laughs) with six? We're talking six. It's a remarkable piece. Trials that could be underway over the course of this election cycle. We have to wait for several of them to be scheduled here, of course. But we want to bring in Jim uh, Zirin. The former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, he also hosts conversations with Jim Zirin on PBS and has been a a voice of reason and trust here over the course of this entire saga of, well, now four indictments, as many as six trials. Jim, it's great to have you back uh, on Bloomberg. Let's start with the breaking news of the day here, March 4th. Your your thoughts on that. Forget the, the political side of it in terms of primary season, but just in terms of being able to prepare. Donald Trump's lawyer, as I mentioned, says it's an outrage to justice. What do you think? I don't think it's an outrage to justice. I mean, you know, we're living the digital age. It's not the way it used to be where uh, the lawyer had to go through a voluminous pages of discovery in order to prepare for trial. Uh, Now everything is digitalized. Uh, It's uh, search friendly. uh, And the government has said it's going to tie the uh, various pieces of evidence to uh, the charges in the indictment. And uh, it's not just one lawyer. It's a team of lawyers and Mm -hmm. paralegals. And uh, they uh, there will be searchable uh, discovery. There'll probably be more to come. Uh, I don't know what 12.8 million may be a modest yeah. number of pages. And uh, I think that the lawyers are really should be up to the task of uh, trying the case on March 4th. Well, so how does a legal team do that? I'm just deeply curious. You you, you, you get 12.8 million pages dropped on you, you get four months. What do you do with that? You divvy this up among the team. What's the exercise? Well, it's on disks and it's searchable. Yes, and of course. Uh, you, this, first, you have to have a theory of the defense. And you will uh, look for uh, pages of discovery that might amplify the uh, the defense of the case. Uh, but uh, they don't have to read every word of uh, 12.8 million documents. If uh, they did, uh, we'd all be here until uh, uh, never, which is the trial date that uh, Donald <laughs> Trump wanted. Right. Well, he still wants it, though. So and, then and that still that. that yeah. It's so a, what, what's the team going to do with that? Basic principle of constitutional law, no trial, no conviction. So oh, if no. you can delay <laughs> the trial interminably or delay the trial until there's a Republican president who might pardon him, uh, then he's home free, at least in the federal system. Sarah sure. pointed out, and not in the state system. Well, so sticking with this federal trial for a moment, though, of course, the, the team's going to come back around uh, with an attempt to, to delay. How likely is it this trial actually begins on March 4th? Well, I think is a realistic prospect of its beginning. Uh, they will undoubtedly make motions uh, and uh, they will uh, uh, motions to dismiss mo- uh, motions for uh, legal insufficiency. I think uh, I don't know what the basis would be for those motions, but I think the judge would Uh, say there has to be a jury determination and uh, we'll pass the determination on the motions and dismiss and uh, until uh, the trial uh, occurs and uh, the prosecutor's evidence is laid out before the jury. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of this idea, knowing that we've got the the criminal uh, cases as well as a couple of civil cases as well? They total six. Could we be in a world in which six trials are underway? in in the balance of this campaign cycle? Well, it's conceivable. The two civil cases would not require Trump's attendance. Uh, That would be the uh, Tish James's uh, fraud case. Uh, She's the attorney general in New York. Her fraud case, uh, the uh, civil case that she brought in New York. And then also the uh, uh, E. Jean Carroll II, which is the libel case uh, that uh, is before Judge Kaplan in New York. And uh, that may not require a trial either because uh, uh, of the findings that were made by the jury in the first trial. We'll have to see uh, how that uh, plays out. Uh, But in any event, they will not require Trump's presence. It will be handled by the lawyers. uh, And that should not be a distraction. Uh, 
And uh, but the other the two cases that are going to be very important are the case in Georgia, of course, and uh, in which uh, Trump may find himself with the uh, speedy trial of uh, October of 23 that his co-defendants have achieved. Um, and uh, although he's asked that he be severed from uh, that aspect of the case. And uh, the March 4, which is, I think, a pretty hard date. But the really important thing to focus on is uh, when we hear of speedy trial, we think, well, Constitution says a defendant is entitled to a speedy trial. But as Judge Shutkin pointed out, and the case law demonstrates, the public interest is entitled to a speedy trial. This is an issue that the public is entitled to have resolved with a jury verdict one way or the other. Trump is presumed to be innocent, but uh, the evidence will be presented by the prosecutor. And uh, should he be convicted, the public is entitled to know that he's been convicted by a jury. So with all of that said, we're going to be choosing candidates here. We're going to be voting as soon as January 15th. That's Iowa, Jim. So the political side of this is, my goodness, how does he do it all? Will he have to be in court uh, for all of these trials? How, how is he going to run a presidential campaign at the same time as managing potentially six trials? Give us a sense of how much geography will be involved here when we consider all of these East Coast courthouses and how often he'll be required to show up in person. I think it's going to be his problem. It depends on the scheduling. Uh, As for the criminal cases, he will be required uh, to appear in court. I suppose he could appear uh, for um, an hour and then uh, withdraw uh, and um, waive his right to uh, uh, be confronted with the charges. I don't know what the Georgia procedure is, but basically uh, all this litigation is going to absorb a tremendous amount of attention in his part. He has lawyers to handle it for him, but he has to meet with the lawyers and confer with them. And they have to fashion a defense to the various charges. And that takes time. And if he's uh, distracted uh, from the political campaign, that's just his problem. He has, uh, as a criminal defendant, uh, no constitutional right to have personal or professional commitments, as Judge Chutkin said. He has to be treated like any other defendant. When we talk about a speedy trial, uh, that obviously has to do with when the trial is taken up, but also the duration of the trial. Jim, are these weeks long, months long? They're going to be underway when the election happens? Which is it? Oh, I think the, the D.C. case starts uh, March 4. It uh, yeah. will uh, end uh, long before the election. I think you're talking about a four to uh to six week trial here, even if it's a, a two month trial. Uh, and we've had uh, uh, significant uh, criminal cases um, uh, in the Southern District of New York that conspiracy cases with multiple defendants and uh, the trial took two months. Um, I think particularly because Jack Smith has pared it down in the District of Columbia to have one defendant, one defendant, Donald Trump, and to prove this conspiracy that he charges, actually three conspiracies. And uh, he ought to be, he's a, a skilled prosecutor and he ought to be able to present his case. And uh, I don't know what the defense will be. I don't know whether Trump can take the stand, but uh, the case really uh, could be tried within a period of, uh, of two months, in my view. Two months. So, and do you feel that way about the other special counsel's trial as well? Uh, Oh, the one in Florida is somewhat more complicated because of the presence of uh, uh, two other defendants and also the presence of the classified documents. But still before the election, I'm guessing you're saying, Jim. Yes, I don't I don't really believe the Florida case uh, will be tried before the election. All right. Here you have it from Jim Zirin. Great to have you back, Jim. He's the former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. He knows of what he speaks. How's that sound like? For a little bit of a messy campaign calendar, we'll assemble our panel next. Rick and Jeannie are on the way. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. 
Live from Washington, where there are many questions about how Donald Trump is going to manage these trials in the throes of a campaign season. Now that we have a date on the January 6th case, this is the one, of course, brought by the special counsel. I know it gets confusing. Jack Smith, January 6th, efforts allegedly to overturn the 2020 election. Is that still allegedly? I thought it was opening open uh, to this. But either way, March 4th, the eve of Super Tuesday is what we're looking at. And you know there's going to be an effort to slow this down. But it is quite a headline to read on the terminal. And it's a great piece of writing, by the way. Trump faces prospect of up to six trials during primary season. We assembled our panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are with us, Bloomberg Politics contributors. Uh, Rick, do you think this actually happens the 4th of March? Well, something's going to happen on the 4th of March. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, you're going to be two days after the Idaho uh, caucuses. And, 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 you know, it's the kind of thing where uh, you just can't even imagine uh, the, in, the, the taking out of the primary season so much time to, uh, you know, have trials for your life. I mean, you know, this is really serious stuff for Donald Trump. And, and he's going to be completely uh, you know, taken back by having to take time off the road, take time out of his campaign, focus on other things. And I think that if March 4th happens, and there's no way to predict it, it will, uh, you know, your expert after expert will give you a different opinion. But uh, yeah. just contemplating this idea of, of having a federal trial in the middle of a primary season is just it blows my mind as someone who is obsessed over dates and where the candidate needs to be and how much time they need <laughs> right. to have and what debates coming up next and and now you're going to enter into this kind of thing and and this is just one of six uh it's yeah, just right. it's just mind-boggling 12.8 million pages genie if you put all the students at Iona University together, I wonder how long it would take them to get through that. Of course, there is a legal team here. But is this fair to say go to trial in four months when you have that much discovery? The students at Iona would get through it a lot quicker than those defense attorneys. <laughs> Kidding. Um, you know, I, I do think, listen, uh, uh, Judge Chuck, and she was very clear today. She asked them to give her a reasonable time frame, a reasonable date. Obviously, April 2026 is not reasonable, particularly when you have somebody who is going on trial, who is posting the kinds of messages he is and tainting the jury pool. So she said, look, guys, gals, give me a reasonable date. They didn't. So she she came back strong. And I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is this doesn't only impact Trump and it impacts him severely. It also impacts the rest of the field, because think about this. You're out there normally after Iowa, New Hampshire, the field starts to winnow down. But now you've got the leading contender facing to Rick's point six trials, four of whom are serious criminal indictments. Do you drop out now after a couple of caucuses and primaries or do you stick with it? Same for the big donors. They might stick with it thinking we need a viable number two or number three. God forbid something happens to our number one. So the entire, I think, calendar is going to be blown up. And this Republican field, anybody who wanted consolidation, probably not going to get it now. Well, we've of course, we've got the, the matter in Georgia as well and whether this is going to go federal, not for Mark Meadows. But we'll we'll wait and see what happens uh, with all of that. We heard from Alina Haba, Donald Trump's attorney on Fox over the weekend talking about this and kind of fascinating, just, you know. I guess he knows what he knows. These are not complicated facts. Look at Fannie. It was a phone call, a phone call that's been around forever that he refers to as the perfect phone call. What is he going to have to be prepped for? The truth? You don't have to prep much when you've done nothing wrong. So that I'm right. not concerned with. So it sounds like then we just go for it, rip off the Band-Aid and hit it in March. Rick, if you were preparing a candidate for Super Tuesday, this again is on the eve of, what would be a normal day? before Super Tuesday, suggest, you know, in a world in which your candidate was not going to trial, where would you have him or her? What would they be doing? Well, you, you would start probably in the East Coast and, 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 and spend two days flying from the East Coast to the West Coast with six to eight stops a day uh, in, that, in that category, just to even set foot on a state that's, that's voting, um, you know, on March 5th. So, I mean, you know, you, you wouldn't be sitting in a courtroom worried about your imprisonment no. you'd be you'd be trying to figure out how to get so many uh rallies at airports that you create a little momentum for the states on super tuesday and 
And so, I, you know, that's you can't imagine how different it would be if someone walks into the campaign here and says, by the way, you can't have the candidate on Super Tuesday or the day before because he's sitting in a courtroom in, you know, Washington, D.C. I mean, we wouldn't even go to Washington, D.C. in a year <laughs> that you're <laughs> Never in a mind, primary. Repeatedly. Nevertheless, having to repeatedly go there to stand trial. Oh, wow. Uh, We've got some new polling data out here uh, today, Jeannie. I don't know if you saw the latest from Emerson. This is a poll of registered voters, which is something that uh, we do want to flag as opposed to likely primary voters. Uh, But it's got Donald Trump at 50, Ron DeSantis at 12. It's creating the headline, at least, that post-debate and post-indictments that this gap might be narrowing. But can we even say that in a 50 to 12 race? Yeah, I I mean, we are really stretching it to say he has dropped compared to the last poll about six points. Um, But, you know, you are still so far ahead that it's hard to know what to make of it at this point. And of course, he did not show up for the debate. He was just indicted for the fourth time and turned himself in in Georgia. And can we just go back to the Alina Haba thing and say, yes, please. She blows up his entire reason for extending the trial. She Mm -hmm. goes on national television television and says he's set to go. He's telling the truth. He doesn't need to think about this or prepare for it. They're not worried at all. This is where the political and the legal and I think Haba has, you know, confused where she is. She's an attorney. She's trying to make a political argument about his ability to tell the truth and not prepare. Then why do they need until April 2026? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh Keep going, Jeannie. So I thank you for cheering for me, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank so, you, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to hear these conflicting messages. There are so many cooks in the kitchen and you have to have somebody take the lead. But now you've got people in the political realm who are saying far different things from the people in the legal realm and they don't jive. So you got a judge caught in the middle saying, listen, folks, this is not reasonable. You're saying one thing, doing another. You're tainting our jury pool. We're going forward. Forward, and he's going to be victimized in court for that, which is unfair to him as a defendant. But as a political figure, this is what his folks are saying publicly. Facts are the facts, apparently, Jeannie, and he knows the facts, according to Alina Haba. I will ask you both about Ron DeSantis and his weekend now, as I've invoked him already, whether he's looking better or worse. He had a tough weekend, and that cheering, by the way, turned into booing uh, in Jacksonville over the weekend. Of course, the scene of this uh, terrible Uh, shooting that made news over the course of the weekend. He had to go back to Florida to a vigil last night. Here's what it sounded like. He's walking in with the first lady and it quickly turns to booze. This is a big group of people standing around waiting for uh, this vigil to begin. He did attend that uh, vigil, but it comes after his comments on the matter as well. He did hold a news conference following the shooting to talk about what they had learned. The state and its people condemn the horrific racially motivated murders perpetrated by a deranged scumbag uh, in Jacksonville at the Dollar General store. Uh, Perpetrating violence of this kind is unacceptable and targeting people due to their race has no place in the state of Florida. Got a lot of criticism for that, not only the use of the term scumbag, but just sort of the, the, the nature of the delivery, the tone, Rick. Is this a moment for Ron DeSantis to show why he should be president? Well, certainly leadership matters, and his um, you know sort of colloquial rhetoric uh, related to this was, you know, uh, it, you could cut it both ways, but um, obviously the some of the people there took issue with that, or took issue in general, you know, with his leadership of the state. But um, this is reality descending upon presidential campaign that, you know, to some degree operates in a bubble. And so pulling him out of that, uh, taking him from South Carolina, where he'd planned to spend the day and uh, take him home to uh, to, you know, uh, preside over, you know, a really disturbing set of facts, you know, is jarring. And so. Uh, you know, but it's a reality. He's a governor of the state. Uh, a lot of the campaign before he got elected, uh, reelected, was uh, how much time are you going to spend in the state? You know, being our governor, and and this is a, a must go. Um, you know, right on the backs of this is going to be a tropical storm. 
that's you right. know coming to the state and you know that's gonna that's gonna disrupt his uh his campaign reality too so um you know look he doesn't have a he doesn't have um uh, you know these horrific uh situation that donald trump does to have to <laughs> go on trial yeah, uh throughout the course of the year but this is a chance to show leadership and you know i think that uh i think that you know sort of you know we're still looking for that breakout moment for him. Well, we're going to get into that a little bit more. It does appear that this storm is going to keep Ron DeSantis off the trail for a bit longer than he might prefer. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzana will have more on the way. That should be handled coming up next. You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch the program live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. They're preparing for hurricane strength conditions in Florida with an eye on Jacksonville Governor Ron DeSantis spending time there following this terrible mass shooting over the weekend, now dealing potentially with two crises at once in the throes of a presidential campaign. And as we heard over the weekend, it's going to mean likely uh, some time off the campaign trail. Let's reassemble our panel for more on the impact of all of this. Rick Davis, Jeannie Shanzano with us, Bloomberg Politics contributors. Rick, I remember uh, specifically the first day of the Republican convention. It was John McCain's convention. And by that, I mean, it was your convention in 2008, St. Paul. And there was a hurricane on the way to New Orleans. And you had a decision to make on whether to run the program per usual that day. You also know what it's like to pull a candidate off the trail uh, when you suspended John McCain's campaign uh, at the threshold of the Great Recession, when, of course, everyone came to Washington to try to figure out a path forward. What would you do now for Ron DeSantis? And if it is removal from the campaign trail, how do you manage that? Well, first of all, you got to you know connect with the American people and tell them why and what you're doing. I mean, when we canceled the first day of the Republican convention in 2008 with Hurricane Gustav, you know, coming down on uh, Florida, you know, everybody at that time still remembered very clearly, you know, the disruption to the state and the, you know, failures of the Bush administration when it came to managing Hurricane Katrina. So that was very much in people's psyche when when we made that decision. And how can you celebrate? How can you have balloons dropping from a ceiling, you know, when people in a key state like Florida, you know, are hunkered down, you know, hoping that, you know, they uh, they don't have their lives taken away. So, it, you know, at some point you have to actually be rational and say, no way. Um you know, you can't do it. And, and we lost a night of television and and, yep. and activity, um, you know, as a result of that. But uh, I think sometimes you're graded for what you don't do. Right. You don't make the mistake yes. of celebrating at a time of national you know, mourning or uh, at, at a time when you know, people are in danger. That's really interesting, uh, Jeannie. Sometimes you're rewarded for what you don't do. Will Ron DeSantis be rewarded for this? And how does he recover if you think it was even an issue uh, from the way he handled the shooting in Jacksonville? He, uh, you know, I think we have to wait and see if he'll be rewarded. Um, he has, he is the governor of the state. He had a mass shooting in his state, a horrific event. On the same weekend, we were celebrating the March on Washington 60 years. And he went back home. And of course, now you have this storm approaching. Um, let's be realistic as to why he was met with so much um, derision when he went back there. It's because this is somebody who has loosened gun laws laws in Florida. He has upset many people who care about civil rights. He has spent endless amounts of time talking about the importance of being woke. He has attacked critical race theory. He has attacked the teaching of our history and specifically slavery. So there are policy reasons that he was met the way he was, um, coupled with the fact that he used language, which was a little bit stunning um, when you hear what he had to say about the shooter himself. Um, but, you know, he is somebody who also, by the same token as governor, has done a fairly good job handling crises so far. So I think he made the right decision just politically going back there um, and being the executive he told us he is and would be because he's going to be able to show that if Americans beyond Florida are watching to the Amer American public, which if he does it well, is going to you know help him. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly the worst thing he could do would be go around the country campaigning while his state is dealing with all of these crises. 
I need to ask you both about Vivek Ramaswamy and the latest controversy surrounding this uh, presidential candidate. You saw him over the weekend defending his remarks about the KKK, more specifically calling Ayanna Presley, the uh, the congresswoman from Massachusetts, a part of the modern KKK. He was asked about it yesterday morning. What I said is the Grand Wizards of the KKK would be proud of what they would hear her say because there's nothing more racist than saying that your skin color predicts something no, about the content you did, you of your viewpoints or your You didn't just, say, that, you didn't just say they would be proud. You said these are the words of the modern Grand Wizards of the modern KKK. That's Dana Bash on CNN, of course. Now, remember that Ayanna Presley was the first black woman elected to represent Massachusetts in Congress. Uh, she had said, we don't need any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. Coming off the, uh, the debate the other night, uh, this is... This is tough stuff here, Rick. It does appear that he's doubling down. Is he doing the right thing or not? Yeah, look, I mean, he's spent the entire weekend, you know, on these Sunday shows, um, uh, really uh, sort of recreating history. I mean, whether it was hmm. uh, a response like this on Ayanna Presley's comments, which, by the way, deserve some derision on their own, right? I mean, like the idea that she can say these things and not be criticized for sounding bias is is a little bit surprising to me but look ramaswamy has his own case to be made and he got stuck in this he got stuck in other comments he's made in his book that were yeah, you know true. diametrically different than what he said on the debate stage so uh he's got some splaining to do and you know it, you put yourself out for these sunday shows and they're not going to be a piece of cake yeah welcome to the nfl here genie Vivek Ramaswamy is now getting a sense of what it's really like to be a presidential candidate. Did he just step in it? Does this threaten his campaign? He did step in it, and it would threaten his campaign if people were listening. But, you know, the fear is, is exactly what he said to Dana Bash. If we listen carefully to that interview, what he said was, oh, I just said these comments to attract and incite a conversation. The reality is we should have a conversation about this issue, but it should not be a conversation with a leading candidate or a candidate for the Republican nomination comparing a representative in Congress who happens to be the first black woman elected to a modern Ku Klux Klan member. It's absolutely outrageous. It's beyond controversial. But he admits right there he's doing it to spark controversy and conversation. And that is the problem. And the reality is this goes far beyond Ramaswamy. It's the same tactic Trump has used. And I fear it's going to be something we hear more of out of candidates than less because it attracts attention, it attracts money. And people sort of set aside the hypocrisy of something he wrote in a book 11 months ago and something he's saying mm. on the trail yeah we're going to be hearing more of that book <laughs> regurgitated over the course of the next couple of weeks and this should provide some very interesting conversation points for the second debate which is september at the ronald reagan library final thoughts from our panel straight ahead of course rick davis and Jeannie shanzano i'm joe matthew in washington on the fastest show in politics this is bloomberg you're listening to the bloomberg sound on podcast Catch us live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app, or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. President Biden leaves the bubble. Well, not really. Washington, you're always in the bubble. But left the White House with the First Lady on what was the first day of school for a bunch of kids. I won't out the school. They didn't put that on the, the guidance from the White House. All it said was they'd visit a public school to welcome students back to class, and indeed they did, remembering, of course, that uh, Dr. Jill is a teacher herself. Here's the president in the classroom. The hardest thing is to come back after three months of not doing any work, not doing any homework, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a lot to make up. Everybody has a lot to catch up from what the, the end of the last year. And uh, you all look so excited to be in math class in your first day. <laughs> What's your hardest subject in school? Math. Math. math, they said, their hardest subject in school, but Jill Biden's an English teacher. Final thoughts uh, from Rick and Jeannie. It's an interesting dichotomy here, Jeannie. You're an educator. While many Republican presidential candidates threatened to shut down the Department of Education, this one is going to school. Is that a good contrast? 
It is a good contrast. And I love the reaction of the kids. They were all giggling. They were all smiling. <laughs> they One of them said, I'm shaking hands with the president. I remember my eighth grade return to school. No president met me. I think it's a very important contrast. And we have to invest more in our schools. And nobody's better equipped to talk about that than Jill Biden and, of course, her husband. Mm-hmm. You spent something like 20 minutes in the hallway shaking hands there, Rick. This is part of the job of being the president, right? What's what's the message? Why take the time? I actually thought he gave us a very clear message. He said, you know, we've just spent three months not doing anything. I think he aptly described the Biden administration <laughs> and exactly uh, why we're in the case we're in. So maybe he should get back to school and do a little something to help our economy and, uh, you know, firm up the, uh, the support oh, for the war. In is Jeannie still there? I didn't I, mean to lay the bait like that, Jeannie. <laughs> I know. And look at Rick Davis going right in for the kill. Rick, inflation <laughs> is doing better. He's celebrating Biden nominees. Be happy. Oh, wow. We almost need another hour now with you two. We found something here. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shansano, Bloomberg Politics contributors, our friends at Sound On, the best panel in the business. Thanks for listening to the Sound On podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at 1 p.m. Eastern Time at Bloomberg.com.